Hello, friends. Welcome to the Christ and Coffee podcast. Today, we have my good friend, Greg Sarian. Greg is the CEO and founder of Sarian Strategic Partners, part of Hightower, and he's one of the top financial advisors in the state of Pennsylvania. If he looks familiar, you might have seen him on CNBC and Fox Business giving his financial advices to the masses. And today, he is here on the Christ and Coffee podcast to talk about his faith and his career, uh, to talk about faith and finance. So Greg, it's so good to see you. Uh, it's great uh, having you on this program. How are you doing, Greg? I'm great. Hi, it's good to see you. And, and it's a thrill to be here. I'm happy to, happy to be part of this. Yeah, you were huge when I was in seminary. We, you, would, you would mentor me, you'd take me out for lunch, and you'd give me advice. And it was so simple advice, but so important to talk about finances, even when right. I was like a broke seminary student. You're like, you gotta be disciplined. This is a spiritual issue. Yeah. Uh, you gotta be disciplined in how you approach what you make. Um, so I, I, I wanted to take this opportunity to kind of pass that knowledge to others um, and, and to talk about the stigma when it comes to finance and, and, and money. Because I think usually when people think about money, they think about uh, the negative aspects when the church talks about it or specifically when the pastor talks about it. Yeah. Um, so. What, what, do you, what do you think that's it? Like, why do you think people are like hesitant to talk about money to begin with? Like, what, what, especially within church settings or in general? Right. It's a great question, Haig. And, and, and the irony is Jesus talked about money more than any other topic in the New Testament. And yet you're right. I think there's a reluctance to bring it up you know, at, at the pulpit. Um, I think it's, it's partially because, you know, giving may make people feel uncomfortable in the culture we're in today, it, it's all about how do I accumulate more? How do I think about putting myself in, in a better, more comfortable financial position? And I think what, what, what I'm trying to learn, and this is a journey for, for me as well and, and my family, is how do we become more dependent upon God with our finances? How do we trust God more? Um, I, think about, I think that money itself isn't the root of all evil. It's, it's our view and our attitude towards money. God made money. Money's a good thing. It's, it's how we keep our perspective on it. Do we recognize that God is the source of all of our resources, our talents, our treasure, our money, our ability to earn? Or do we think we're in control of that? Yeah, I love it because the, the, the Bible verse you mentioned often gets, um, or we're hinting at, is like often gets misquoted in Timothy. It says, like people say the love, money is the root of all evil, but the, the Bible right. verse says the love of money is is the root of all evil so the money in itself is not evil it's where your love ultimate love is that will determine the behavior and the actions um so how did you get into the finance uh, business like what what led you to the this career it was yes i didn't in a million years think i would end up here uh it was an internship i had uh my last two years of college working at deloitte and and back in the early 90s they were beginning to do um, be only financial planning for their tax clients. And, and I really loved just the, the few meetings I sat in on and, and some of the research work I would do in terms of sitting down with families and talking about, you know, where they want to send their kids to college and how they want to position themselves in their retirement. And just that relationship of understanding what people are trying to accomplish and helping them get there was, was really of interest to me. And, and, you know, my kids call me boring. I've had one job at two companies in, in almost 30 years. So, yeah, I, th I think that 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 being committed to one company or two companies is not normal these days. Where back in the day, it was it was the norm. You you stick with yeah. your company, you have that allegiance. Um, but yeah, the the world is constantly changing. So oh, so and then what about your faith? When did you become Christian? Yeah, so I I started following Christ my uh, freshman year in high school. It was actually at an AEYF uh, conference a biannual in California where the gospel message was really clearly laid out before me and, and, you know, God was tugging at my heart. And, and so starting about age 14 and it's been a journey ever since of just trying to draw closer and closer to, to Christ and, and do what he says to do and try to model his behavior. Wow. And, and then what about the, the spiritual aspect of your job? So how, do, how does your faith, uh, play a role in how you, you do finances because like the, the when the new testament talks about the tax collector there's this yeah. instant stigma it's lumped together with the sinner 
And I think in our society, when we hear like investment banker or hedge fund manager or, or banker, that's the, the new version of tax collector, and especially among the, the youth countercultural yep. groups. So, so how, how do you reconcile the, that stigma or talk? It's funny. Hi, guys. See it completely the other way because our business, our business is a service business. We're a helping business. Right. Um, and I think when we bring a servant attitude, which is what Christ calls us to do, is to serve and love others. And that's the attitude that, that my team and I bring to, to the families that we serve, meaning it's all about helping. It's all about bringing knowledge, information, and ideas and, and helping them figure out what they're trying to accomplish and bringing information to them that they not, may not be aware of to further them along in that journey. So it's actually a very close relationship that you build. And in that, I do have opportunity to share my faith and share my perspective. Um, I have to be careful because most of the families I serve, I don't see people who are significant givers or who are actively involved in faith issues. But there are opportunities when you get close to people and they go through deaths and they go through divorces, they go through you know, business situations and you know, to talk about what, how you view life and what your perspective is, not from a worldview, but from a from a perspective of a follower of Christ. Absolutely. And um, so, yeah, I think that that's a beautiful way to view it because it's like everyone needs to use money to live. And for whatever reason, uh, I don't remember growing up in school. I have a doctorate and like the only time money came up was uh, AP economics, a senior year of high school. And the only reason like basic economics was taught of like, this is what a credit card is. This is what right. debt is. This is what loan is. Right. It's like for like a week period. And that's it. Like the most important thing <laughs> to give bread on your table is not discussed in our educational system. Right. And um, so like, I'm a millennial. A lot of us have student debt. A lot of us can't afford to buy a house. There's this... Um, sense that, that this generation can't uh, reach certain moments of life, like get married, have a family, have a kid, because a large part of it is financial. What advice would you give to, to millennials, like just graduating school, they have some student debt, um, they're trying to, um, trying to create some funds to, to kind of reach those next milestones of wanting to get married, wanting to, uh, to, to provide for a family one day? Yeah, it, it's, it's counterintuitive, perhaps, Hyde, but I think that the earlier you start thinking about your income and your wealth from an eternal perspective, from a, from a perspective of how it reflects, it is reflected in your faith, uh, the better. Because I, I look at, at giving and, and living in obedience to God through how you handle your finances uh, as part of our Christian journey. And so even early on when you first start working, I think one of the best pieces of advice I got right when I graduated uh, from college was from, from Harar Sagarian in, in, he was an AYF leader. And I'll never forget it was um, coming home from a, from a conference my senior year of college. I said, how do I honor God in my career? I wanna be a, a godly businessman. I didn't even know what that meant back then, but I knew that's what I wanted to aspire to. He didn't miss a beat. He said, open up two checking accounts and in one deposit 90% of your paycheck. And that's what you learn to live on. In the other, you deposit 10%. And what that will do is it will require you to be obedient and trust God with your career because he's in control of that outcome. And as God prospers you, and this was the key, as God prospers you and blesses your business, you increase his and you decrease yours. And, and you know, I was 21 years old and I didn't know any better. So I said, okay, if that's what her I was telling me to do, I better do that. So that's what I started doing. And uh, I just can't tell you, you know, you, this, the expression you can't outgive God is, is so true. I think about the scripture in Malachi where uh, it says, you know, trust me in this, bring me your tithe and fill up the storehouses and I'll show you if God will bless your efforts. And so uh, I think the, the sooner we can learn to live in obedience, the keeping our finances in, in obedience to God and trust, trusting God with our finances and not thinking that it's in our control, but in his, it also releases you from that anxiety high you mentioned of, gosh, am I saving enough money, building enough money, paying down my debt. When God owns it all, 
God's in control of it all. So just to under- clarify, so the advice you were given, okay, so you 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 have a paycheck, ninety percent of it is yours to to manage, and then that ten percent is already a tithe. That's correct. And um, so and then over time, you you give more to the that ten percent, so you increase the tithing. Yeah, over time, as you know, <laughs> my first job. At, at was was at Merrill Lynch right at a college and I started my career and I was making twenty four thousand dollars a year as a base salary, and you know, I started putting ten percent into that checking account into one and then nine percent in the other and as as I as as God blessed my business I I went from you know above ten percent to, to the tithing account and and below ninety and and now those ratios are very different in terms of what you know how Laurel and I view our finances and. God continues to bless um, bless our efforts. That's amazing because I think I, I think a lot of the church problems would be solved if if the Christians took the tithe seriously. <laughs> Forget about going over ten percent. Let's just if like if they even give like five percent. If if all the church was radical and gave five percent of their income, I think we'd see a lot more ministries, a lot more uh, uh, nonprofits doing amazing work. But even if you're like say you have student debt. Or would you still encourage giving a tithe? Because I, I get that often. Like people tell me, like I'm not going to give until I get out of my debt, and then once I financially establish myself, I'm going to give more. Kind of like the Bill Gates model. I'm going to become a billionaire, and then w- once I peak, I'm going to have my non-profit uh, foundation, and I'm going to give to everyone. Yeah. No, it's a great question. And, and first, let me answer by saying. I think that the concept of tithe is an Old Testament concept. And so I think God looks at our heart, Tide. And so mm-hmm. I don't think it's necessarily the percentage that's between you and God. But I think about the parable too of the widow's coins, right? Where Jesus looked at the widow giving of her, her out of her little amount, but that was sacrificial versus the Pharisees who gave a small, a much larger amount, but as a percentage was not really sacrificial. So the way I would answer your question is, God looks at our heart attitude in terms of how we give, not, not what we give is my belief. And number two, I will tell you from just personal experience and observing, if, if you don't start managing small amounts and, and giving small amounts when you're earning small amounts, it gets a lot harder. Uh, and I can tell you from my own experience, but also watching our clients who, who, who tend to have larger amounts. Um, it's much more difficult when those dollar signs and those zeros compound. So getting in that discipline, even if it's a small percentage of a small amount, yes, managing your debt, getting out of debt, that's, all, that's for a whole nother podcast. We're happy to do what God says about debt uh, is smart. You, you want to get out of debt. However, I agree with you. I think it's important to start. God doesn't need your money, but God wants your obedience. Right. And that's how you show God you're obedient by trusting him, even when there is a challenge of debt and knowing he's got it. He's going to, he's got your back. Yeah. So it's, 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 a, it's a more of a, an act of worship and saying, um, when I give that percentage, it's, it's like you said, God doesn't need the money, but it's, it's more of a, a heart check, like saying, all right, everything belongs to God. I'm a steward of this. Even this. And I trust you. And I trust you, Lord. You're going to, you've got, you've got this. So someone may be hearing this and they'd be like, all right, maybe if, if I give my money, God's going to bless me. Isn't that prosperity gospel? Like how, how, how is that different than uh, prosperity gospel? Just to play devil's advocate a little bit. Yeah, no, I get that. And, and see, the thing is, there is no guarantee, Hyde, right? I mean, it's I, God's in control of all things. And, and I believe that if God chooses to bless you and, and put lots of zeros behind your earnings going forward, that's, that's up to God. But more importantly, what, what I think you get out of that by obeying God and tithing even of a small amount is financial peace. Because when you can turn it over to him and you can know he's in control of your career, he's in control of your debt, he's in control of your budget. I'd much rather have God in control of my career and my budget than me. Right. Because I know that he's got the outcome under his reign and not mine. I do, however, believe that it's biblical when you think about why would what's another motivation to give besides being obedient? And again, maybe this is for another conversation, but I take God at his word when he talks about treasure in heaven. You know, scripture's clear 
that we can choose to invest our treasure in the here and now and the temporal, that's going to fade away. But, but I also believe, God, that, that there will be uh, benefits and rewards for how we handle our resources, whether they're large or small, here in terms of how we experience heaven. And so um, I do think that there is a motivation to be obedient, trusting God, knowing that there is going to be, I don't know what that experience is. I don't know what that outcome is, but I trust God when he says that the showing treasure in heaven means that there will be benefits for you later on. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely clear parables that indicate there is some sort of reward system for stewardship. Um, the talent parable for mu mu much is given for like the, when Jesus trusts you and God trusts you, he's going to give you with more more responsibilities. And that could be uh, the, the parables are usually money analogies, but it's 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 that's part of it. It could be your talents, what you do for the kingdom. And that's, that's that doesn't sit well with a lot of people because we think like, all right, everyone goes to heaven. But but yeah, we, we have to look at those par parables to, to kind of understand that there is some sort of reward system. Um, yeah. Uh, and not that you do this for the reward, but you do this because you're just being obedient and trusting. Right. Um, and you're not really doing it for the reward itself. You're just doing it out of obedience. That's right. Um, that's so important. Um, so what, what would you say to someone who's like uh, struggling with their finances? What, what, what would you normally do? Because like, there's so many people have credit card debt. So many people are living beyond their means. Um, any just practical advice or resources? Yeah. Because I guarantee statistically someone listening to this is struggling financially. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, it sounds pretty basic. Hi, but, but start with the budget. Um, understanding what's coming in every month, what's going out every month. And I think if in that budget, you, you have a clear sense of what are your fixed expenses, what are your variable expenses? But, but I believe that 10% should go to the Lord, his work in his kingdom. And I also think 10% should go towards your future, whether that's saving in a Roth, a 401k, just building up a, a after-tax investment account, and then living on the 80%. If, 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 young, if a young professional can start by doing that, save 10%, give 10%. And then here's the challenge, as their income increases, at least maintaining those, right? Because that 10% of a bigger number will become bigger, both on the giving and the saving. You'll always be in a position where you're right with God, where you're, you're serving and obeying him in terms of your career outcome, but you're also building a buffer, a nest egg, so that if something happens with your job, there's a boss that you don't like or doesn't like you, you've got resources to be able to alter and make a change. And I think the, the the danger is there's never the quite that moment of making it right. Like so, I, I mean, I'm starting to observe that when people make more money, they they get the bigger house, the bigger car, and that same that rat race could be unending unless our heart is kind of set. And this 10% saving, 10% um, tithing, 80, and just figuring out how to live on the 80% is is a challenge regardless of your income level. Um, uh, so so. Any like I think that's the the thing that eighty percent living within your means that's that's the struggle right because there's the temptation yeah uh, to to just wanting to be up to date with the latest gadgets to make sure uh, we're we're going to the fancy restaurants um, any any some any pointers there to like how how does one create that self discipline to live within their means yeah it's a good question. And I think, you know, one motivation may be what does, what does financial independence look like? Meaning, when do you want to have autonomy in your career where maybe you can back down your pace of work and work less and maybe not retire fully, but change the pace of your work? I, and also, for people who are in your age group, for millennials, the way you view retirement and financial dependence is different than for your parents. Uh, I just read a report earlier this week that said, given what happened to COVID, social security was already in pretty poor shape yep. before COVID. And I read a report now that says as soon as 2033, 2034, there may be a meaningful reduction you know, in benefits for those who are still in the workforce. So I think it's really prudent to be thinking about you should be putting aside that 10% 
to build up um, some resources. And of course, we already talked about why to give the 10%, but it's all about making choices, right? You've, you've, no matter what your income is, whether you're making you know, $24,000 a year or $2.4 million a year, making decision to live within your means, it's a personal choice. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What are some other trends that you, you think are coming with the, with the way the economy and how COVID shaped things? Because I feel like with the pandemic, uh, a lot of the predictions of, of people are coming to fruition now with the internet. So when the internet was where people thought that people would work from home, people wouldn't care to live in the city as much. Yep. But, but now I think COVID kind of pushed some of those trends. And what, what, are some, what, are, what did the COVID do to the economy? And, and what, what, what do you see with technology happening? Yeah, I think, you know, so I'm not an economist, Hyde, but what I will tell you is we're counseling our clients right now to plan on a more muted return environment. Um, we've seen since the financial crisis of 08 and 09, and for a lot of you millennials, you may not even remember that that vividly, or more importantly, have been invested in the financial markets at that time. But for those over 40, they really do remember how dramatic and, and how, how difficult that time was. But frankly, since that 08, 09 period, 07, 08, really, markets have been unbelievably good. We've had declining interest rates, expanding corporate earnings to the point where, you know, stock returns over the last decade have been 14, 15, 16%. So even a balanced sort of a, a mixed portfolio has had high single digit returns. And so I think what we've been counseling investors to, to really understand is that you should not be counting on those double digit returns going forward I believe we're heading into a period where we're going to see tighter monetary policy, which means a change in the direction of interest rates. I think we're going to see uh, more pressure on corporate earnings, and I think we're going to see some, some meaningful tax reform, not, none of which is suggesting we're going to see a meltdown or a bear market looming imminently. But I do think that, that young people should be not counting on 15% year-over-year returns on their 401k but maybe in the area of five, seven, eight percent, which is historically what, what investments have returned. Secondly, I think that you're going to see a, a change in tax rates. Um, you know, for those of your listeners and parishioners who are in the higher income thresholds, I do think you're going to see pretty significant changes in the income tax rates, capital gain rates, all of which put pressure on your personal budget because now there's less to save and to invest and to give. Wow. And um what so like we talked about the tithe um so is that 10 percent uh or whatever percentage that is the, the goal is to give a percentage but do you is that um only going to your local church or that's going to like um anyone uh, any organization that's like a ministry it's a great question and i think it's subjective hi that's yeah. between you and god so here's what i do so i think about it on what, what did Christ call us to do? He called us to love our neighbor, right? He called us to care for the widows and orphans. He, he, he calls us to care for those who are in need. And so for Laurel and I, we sort of break it up between churches where we fellowship, missionary organizations that advance the gospel overseas to students, um, you know, to, to prisoners, and then to those who are in need, to widows, to orphans. So I think it's really important to think about um, all of that aspect, yes, you want to give to your local church, but I think you also want to find prayerfully consider what organizations are advancing gospel message that are that you're passionate about. Yeah. yeah. When, when also a wise piece of advice that was given to me before you consider giving, research the organization. Yeah. There's something called a 990. A 990 is a nonprofit equivalent of a 1040. And the 990 is the tax return that the nonprofit files each year. If you look at that 990, it will tell you how leanly the organization is running. How, how are they using your money? Because I view myself, I'm a conduit, right? It's not my money, it's God's money, but I'm a steward and I need to be making sure the organizations that we're giving to are being resourceful with the monies that, that I'm moving over to them. And that 990 will tell you what, how they're running their budgets, their expenses. It's a good document to use in the vetting process. 
Yeah, and that, that, I guess that, that same thing applies to the church, right? The, if, if the prosperity gospel preacher is having a private jet through your giving, you might want to reevaluate whether I should support this church or not. Uh, but but the, the the other thing that you were you were hinting at, uh, you you always feel like you're sacrificing regardless of the, the total income. So like there's always a sense of I'm I'm giving more beyond to the point where it's going to be a, a leap of faith, sort of. Right? Is there some sense of always sacri sacrifice? Um, that's my belief, Hyde. Is that when you and I think that's the beauty of increasing the the percentage as God increases your income, because it does keep you dependent. I think that God can use men and women who are on their knees. If we are, if we think we have it all under control and we've got it all figured out, I don't believe we can be as useful tool in God's hands. But if we force ourselves to live in a way where we're dependent on God, we have to keep trusting him in our career, in our family, with our health, uh, and reflecting that in our finances, which means living on meaningfully less than you earn, that keeps you in a position of dependence on God, which is where I think we're then the best putty and clay in his hands. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's regardless of the total income. It, it's a lifestyle. That's why the widow, two cents, was super sacrificial. Right. Um, that's where the expression comes. I'll give you my two cents. Uh, yeah. But that's, that's the, thank you for your two cents, uh, Greg. Any final um, thoughts or comments you'd like to leave to, to those who may be listening when it comes to faith and, and money? No, I just think trust God, right? Just really trust him, trust in his word. And, and I think the freedom that you'll feel and the release of anxiety from your finances when you really just live it up, give it up to him. Because when he's in control, he, he's got the outcome covered as well. That's great to hear. And uh, thank you so much for, for joining. And I would love to have you come back and maybe we could be more specific with how to get out of debt and what does the Bible say about debt and, and how to manage it, especially in our society that constantly yeah. uh, puts us in situations where that's the case. Yeah, um, love to. So, so thank you so much, uh, Greg, and it's good catching up. Uh, thank yeah. you for those who are listening. Remember to stay caffeinated, my friends. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to comment in the, in the sections. Uh, if whatever platform you're listening to it, please like and subscribe. It helps promote this podcast. And uh, hopefully we'll see you next week, everyone. So God bless you and thank you for listening. Oh.